Going there sucks, man. Because you, cause it's in the middle of nowhere. It's a desert. You get out there, it's hot. I mean, it's sunny. And you know, look at me. I don't do well in the sun. And you, but when you stand there in front of this pyramid, you're like, oh, what the? It's just a stone pyramid. And if you want to see the biggest pyramid in the world, anybody know where the biggest pyramid in the world is? Any chance? It's in Las Vegas, the Luxor Hotel. That's the biggest pyramid in the world. <laughs> so if you want to see something really breathtaking, go to Las Vegas and stand in front of the, the Luxor and go, wow, big pyramid. But instead, you, you go out to the desert and you're, you, you have to cover up, you don't know who you are because it's sunny, it's hot. You get out there, and then you stand in front of this pyramid and you go, oh, I, I get it now. You know, and it is a trip. <clears throat> if you were Cleopatra and you were standing at the base of the pyramid, Right now, you're closer in age to, to, to Cleopatra than Cleopatra was to the building of the pyramids. That's how ancient these things are. And it's so neat, man. We just found a, a two secret chambers inside the Pyramid of Giza. I was just reading an article yesterday. These are still our technology. They found a couple more pyramid, uh, a couple more uh, chambers in there. I want to know what's in there, man. It's got to be something cool, you know? But in any event, when you stand in front of the Eiffel Tower, you say, I get it now. You stand in front of the pyramids, and you're just thinking it's a stone pyramid, no big deal. But then you realize, huh, okay, I get it now. And if you if you study some things about history and you, you understand the things that have happened in front of the pyramids, if you understand like Napoleon's war, and it's a Napoleon's battle where he stood there in, in, the, you know, in, in the shadow of, of 1700, uh, 17 centuries, ready to fight with the Marble Army, and you realize, wow, some really cool stuff has happened here. Some stuff that you can learn about. But anyway, when you stand, when I stood there in the Sistine Chapel and I looked straight up, <clears throat> and you can see God uh, all the way up, <clears throat> and then you see Adam. Chill. And the picture, the, the colors are so incredibly bright. You can't get that from the pictures. We think of them as just like old paintings. No, it looks like a cartoon, man. It looks like a comic book, but a comic book with really bright colors. It's unbelievable, those colors. And then you realize how, how Michelangelo painted that thing. Oh my god. But anyway, what you see is, there's this, there's this gap, this little space between where God is reaching out and Adam is really not. And surrounding the, the God figure, you have these angels who are looking around like, what's going on here? Like, they're just like, they're marveling at this creation of God. It's like, he's not one of us. He's something completely different. And God is stretching out, and Adam is just like this. And, and it pisses me off. Because <laughs> all that Adam has to do is that. <laughs> but he can't be bothered. He's just kind of like, Ugh. like, oh, God, if you really want to reach me, you could reach farther. I mean, you're God, after all. Just move the cloud closer, because he's on a cloud. And Adam, I mean, he's even leaning backwards. Even if he just sat up like this, he would be able to touch. Or if he'd be able to just sit there and, do it and, and raise his finger, he'd be able to touch. And you sit there and you're like, come on, just lift your finger. And then you realize all of the things in your life that were, where things are stretching out to reach you and to meet you, and you're not lifting your finger. And it becomes humbling. Because you sit there and go like, why can't you just... And now start to cycle through your own life and realize all of the things in your life, why can't I just lift my finger in this one area, or stop reclining so damn much and just sit up and make that connection. You know, I suppose it's to God, but it's also to the people in your lives. You know? <clears throat> I wonder if any of you guys have that person in your life who you could reach out to, and they're reaching out to you all the time, and you just don't reach out back to them for whatever reason. I have a, a sister who, uh, she lives in the Midwest, and she's always reaching out to me. And if I, if I post something on Instagram, she's always up there, that's my baby brother. And I'm like, 40 years old, man. <laughs> Your baby brother. But I didn't hurt, to her, I, I guess I am. And I didn't even grow up with her around me. I grew up with, you know, she lived in the Midwest, I didn't. But she's made so many efforts to, to reach out and make these connections to me, because she's big on family. And about six months ago or so, I sent her a message finally and said, um, would it be okay to give you a call sometime to just talk because we haven't, you know, and I'm, I'm telling you, by the way, I've, I've only ever seen her three or four times in my life, not even that many times, but 
family is so big to her that she's always trying to make that connection, make that reach out. And I never, I never reciprocate. Um, I remember I was talking to a class with him about this, and I was saying, you know, I should reach out to her sometime. And my class was like, yeah, you should. And this is like, God, like seven, eight years ago or so. And then when I went and sat down at my desk, um, I had a message from her on my phone. And she just said, hey, just seeing how you're doing. So I messaged her back. We don't even message, by the way. It isn't like we text, but just never talk. We, we'll message like once every few years or a couple of years. And I, I messaged her back and said, that's so funny you messaged me. I was just telling my class about you. And then she's like, oh, wow, what were you saying? And then you look at the next message from me. It's like three years later. I never even responded to that message. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So, I mean, I guess if she, she really wanted to talk to me, she could get a plane, right? I mean, she could fly to San Diego. She, just, she has time, right? If she really wanted to make that connection. <clears throat> but I think a lot of times it's, it's because I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't know if you guys have a family member like that or someone in your life that you just don't know what to say. What would you say to them? Because there's so much time and geography that's been between you that you just don't know what you would say. It's like... If I, if I had a phone, let's say, and I came in here and said, hey, here's a phone to talk to your, you can talk to, you can talk to your great-great-grandmother with this phone. You know, but you get, you get one phone call. Well, I wonder how many of you go, oh, right, pick up the phone and then start talking. What would you say? Anybody? Uh, I'll leave it at that. Anyway, so I think about Michelangelo and how it is that he, that he painted this, this chapel. First off, he didn't want to do it. That's one of the beautiful things about it. He did not want to do it. Michelangelo, he's this, he's this incredibly rough character. He's a madman. He's not insane in the conventional sense. But he's this guy who, who storms around Florence and he just doesn't really, he doesn't really care about anything except for the thing on which he's singularly focused, which is, which is to create. Just to create. He's, um, he's, in, he's in Florence, and word gets to him that the Pope wants the ceiling painted. And he's bestowing this great honor on Michelangelo to come and paint the ceiling. And Michelangelo, you know, Michelangelo gets word, and he's working. The, the guy's making a door on a church. That's what he's doing. He's making a door. And word comes to him and says, the Pope is, you know, has to, I, can't do a, I can't do a ceremonial voice. Well, I'll do a ceremonial voice. The Pope has to create you to attend this. And he's like, uh, I can't right now. Why? But the Pope has ordered you. I'm making this door. <laughs> He's too busy making a door to go and, and get, get paid a whole gob of money and prestige. He just didn't care. And so they go back to the Pope and they're like, hey man, uh, he's making a door right now. <laughs> so he said he can't, he can't really come. And he's like, you go back there, you get the dude. What the hell? He's Michelin. So they go back to him and he's like, Nah, he finished the door by that time. Now he's working on something else. He's like, nah, I'm, I'm working on this little miniature cast of a, of a statue. I've got this idea. And they're like, well, the Pope has ordered you. Will you tell the Pope to come here himself? I'm not going. Tell him to paint the ceiling. <laughs> so they go back and they're like, uh, you should maybe paint the ceiling yourself. <laughs> so now he orders and says, bring him here. Arrest him if you have to. You drag him over here. And he didn't want to go. So he's hiding from them because he has other things that he's doing. He's, he, he doesn't care about the prestige. He doesn't care about the money. This is the guy who would get so singularly focused on a painting that he would forget to eat. He would forget to shower. He would forget to change his clothes. You know what happens if you don't change your clothes for a while? You stink. What's that? You stink. You stink, but it's worse than that. So we have this issue with homeless people where they don't get fresh changes of clothes. When... Um, when you, uh, when, you just, when you just live, <laughs> there are oils that secrete from your body, and they go into your clothes. That's one of the things that makes your clothes smell. It's the bacteria and stuff that comes out of you and into your clothes. So if you sit there and go, wow, my clothes stink. Man, my clothes, man, you did that. So they, they go with the oils come out of your skin, they go into your clothes, and then they dry. And they come out of you again, and then they dry. And over time, the, that, those oils, they end up fusing the pants to your legs, which means that when you go there and you take your pants off, you're taking skin with it, like layers of skin. And the longer that you go without changing those things, or without changing your socks, or even changing your shoes, that's what happens over time. So Michelangelo would get so singularly focused on the stuff that he was working on, and he would get these horrible sores on his body, 
because he wouldn't change his pants for weeks and weeks and weeks on end because he was too focused on this thing that he was creating. There's a story about his boots even where they'd have to cut his boots off of him and he'd have these horrendous sores on his feet, like just, you know, layers of skin missing and infection. They had to wrap him up and the guy could barely walk. So he would have to walk on his heels even. And guess where he was going when he walked on his heels? To make his next creation. Long, scraggly beard, hair everywhere. This is a man who walked around Florence and he had some place he had to be. Because he did. Not just physically, but spiritually, emotionally, artistically, man. And so, you can contrast him completely by the character of Leonardo. Leonardo apparently had a very well-groomed beard. He liked to wear purples and pinks and these colors. And he would walk around Florence and he would wave his arms around and he would speak very eloquently. And Michelangelo, of course, and Leonardo did not get along because Leonardo looked down on Michelangelo, referred to him as a beast, as an animal. And Michelangelo agreed with that, said yes, but not in the way that you mean it. And so there's a story of Michelangelo who's painting the Sistine Chapel because the Pope does finally get him to go, as he always does. There's a funny meme about that. If you know the meme, then you know the meme. And he's laying on his back and he's painting. And as he's painting, he falls asleep. And this is a chapel that's like 30 feet up in the air, if you look at it. You know, at least the scaffolding was well, it's higher than that at its peak, but he's about 30, 30 feet, so about three, about three stories off, the, off of the, the, um, the ground. And as he's painting, he falls asleep. And as he falls asleep, he rolls and he falls off of the scaffold. <laughs> Hits the ground. Fortunately, he didn't land on his head. The fall woke him up. <laughs> so he got back up and he climbed the scaffold and he continued his painting. <laughs> he fell three stories. I, I think it, I, I've read I've read anywhere from three stories and I read as high as five uh, five or six stories. When you, when you look at the at the height of it, it's like five it's like fifty feet up. But I've heard that he was on a on a lower scaffold at the time working on something else. So I'm trying to be I'm trying to be I'm trying to give you the, the the most conservative version of the story. I'd hate to say to you guys, he fell like a hundred feet, right? <laughs> and you go read and you're like, oh, that was 30. It's still pretty high, you know? So I'll say 30, but I think it was higher than that. Um, but no, I don't think he broke anything. I think he just got all banged up. If he, if he did, he wouldn't have known it, because he would have gone back to work exactly as he was before that. This is a guy, I hate to say it, but I will. And I'll move on from it. But this is a guy who, man, I, I'd hate to see if that personality was alive today. And he had access to, like, I don't know, Microsoft Paint or, or Instagram. <laughs> I, wonder if that's a, I wonder if that's a talent and a genius that would never have been realized. Because there were too many other things to distract him. Because you can't become great like that unless, unless you're singularly focused. And singular focus isn't something that you're necessarily born with. It's something that you can develop. In other words, you work on something, and you, you remove all the other distractions from your life, and then you see little improvements on it, and that gets you even more hyper-focused, or even more hyper-focused, and then you lose track of everything else in life. You know, there's too many other distractions, too many other things that would be cool to work on. I don't know if, if, if you'd ever realize that, that genius, that talent, it's one of the things that concerns me about today. Uh, there are a lot of people, there's a lot of, I uh, imagine anyway, that there's a lot of squandered and wasted talent from people who, if we just had fewer distractions and less comfort, I imagine you'd create some really cool things. You know? The idea of somebody who would be so singularly minded that, that their boots would fuse to their skin intentionally, I'm sorry, not intentionally, but not being homeless, you know, that's, pretty, that's pretty rare. I think about like, um, when, I got my, when I did my first master's degree, I, I, you have to write a um, uh, call a practicum for it. It's a, it's a long essay, like 30 pages or so. And um, you have to do a bunch of research and so forth. And I remember I was sitting there just kind of waiting for inspiration. And I sat there, and, I, and then one day it hit me. I sat there and I worked on it. I wrote the whole thing, like in the course of like three days or something like that, two or three days. And for two or three days, I didn't eat. I didn't sleep. I, 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 I felt, uh, I guess that's not true. I fell asleep in the middle of a sentence. And I woke up, <laughs> I remember... Finally, I kind of jumped out of it, and I had some like 18 pages of the letter M, you know, because I fell asleep, I guess, in such a way that my finger was just resting on the letter M, 
and it was just like 18 pages of the letter M. And I looked at deciphering. I was wondering, is there is there a code here? <laughs> has, the, has the universe given me something to work off of here? No, it was just 18 pages of. Mm. I wish it had been Z. I wonder if there's ever anything in your lives that you get like that about, that there's something that you get a hold of and you just can't let it go. I hope so. I hope, so. I hope that there's something like that. Maybe not such that your pants are going to fuse to your skin, not so much that you're going to end up with 18 pages of the letter M, but that there's something that has you so hyper-focused that you're able to, to shut out the distractions. And sometimes you have to force yourself to do that. You have to put away the distractions. This, it goes back a little bit to what I've talked about before, about going to high places, separating yourself from, from things. You know? What Marti is saying is that that's a very specific personality type, a creator. And I know that some of you are that thing. Some of you are that thing. Like I was just thinking about um, like how much that stuff can, can I don't know, captivate, maybe? Um, it's too bad that uh, Anissa and Ariane aren't here. I was thinking about this last at the, um, at the assembly last week. And yet, people were outside, it was sunny, and everyone's just like doing, you know, stupid shit, you know, throwing things, yelling. And as soon as dancers go out there, what happens? Everybody just <laughs> transfits, hyperfocus. I know there's some reason that some of you are, and there's other reasons that people are just like, there's something about movement that we're just like, and then they do something, and someone just goes, woo, and then we're like, hey! <laughs> we all respond to it. A lot of times we don't even know why. We're just doing it because everybody else did. And then we go back to just being transfixed by that. And as soon as that's off, then, then, the, you know, then the, the jokes off of the script start, and then we, we go back to kind of normal. But as soon as that kind of thing starts, there's something about that that just transfixes us because well, there's something in movement that does that to us. There's something like that in color. There's something like that in paintings. There's like something about that in, in music. You ever hear something that just, like a song, it just makes you stop? And then all of a sudden you, you realize it's three minutes later or something like that? I hope so. I hope that there's something like that that you can connect to. But all that stuff is, is put together by people who love and create. They love and they create. And then, of course, he juxtaposes that with people who hate and destroy. And by, by the way, I, I, wanna, I really like the fact that we talk about loving and creating, it's not just about art. It's not just about art. I mentioned Michelangelo because I love Michelangelo. He's this guy who storms around, uh, around Florence. He's got something to say. He's got some place to be. If people like him, they like him. If they don't, they don't. He doesn't really care. He doesn't even notice. He's too hyper-focused on the thing that he, that, he has to, that he feels that he has to do in life. That's, that's my man right there. <laughs> Versus Leonardo. And anybody, Michelangelo. Not the most talented guy in the world, the hardest working dude in the world. A, a visionary man. This guy saw this old beat up piece of stone somewhere. And some soldiers are carrying it away. And he stops him and he says, Oh man, you're late. I was just talking about you guys. Watch oh. the well, yeah, watch the video. I was just talking about you guys. Oh, you can't tell us right now? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the middle of talking about Michelangelo. <laughs> And he sees this yeah. stone, and these soldiers are carrying it away, and he yells at him, Hey, put that down! It's like this old piece of stone that was sitting in a courtyard for years. He's like, hey, put that down. I'm like, what? He's all, David's in there. And they're like, uh, whatever that means, dude. So they, they put it down because Michelangelo, they know he's got something on his mind, so they put the stone down, and then eventually he gets to it, and then you, show, and then you can go and see the result of that, which is his statue, David. But that took him a long time to make. Years of visioning. Of envisioning, and then years of working away at it. And then several years ago, some asshole took a sledgehammer to it. That's why I use that example that you've heard me use before. How long did it take you to make a statue? How long did it take one guy to, to destroy it? This guy shows up with a sledgehammer and goes, <laughs> knocks it. He broke it. They were able to glue it back, but people jumped on him, stopped the guy. But just one whack of a, of a sledgehammer destroyed it. One wrong little chisel mark would have made the thing completely different. And yet, he was, Michelangelo was able to put thousands of those together. You know? But one whack from a sledgehammer destroys it. So I talked about Michelangelo just because that's, you know, I like Michelangelo. But man, these things. Love is the only thing that can create things like healthy relationships, healthy environments. Hate can, can make horrible relationships and horrible environments. That's 
easy. I think we've all seen examples of that stuff. And that would be really easy for us to, to make. You ever sit there and just say something horribly rude to somebody, or you hear someone do that? You know, how hard is it to say something critical or rude to somebody? How hard is it to say something nice? Especially if you're not sure how it's going to be re received. Maybe it's someone who's like, oh, it's weird to tell them that you like their, I don't know, shoelaces, whatever. <laughs> something strange. I don't want to tell them it sounds weird. Or to tell a stranger something like that. You know, well, because then strangers might, yeah, 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 yeah. Might, 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 might. It also might make the world a better place. Maybe that's the thing that saved the person's life that day. The fact that they were, that they were walking around the world thinking that nobody else noticed they even existed. And there you are on the trolley seeing, I don't know, dinosaurs on their shoelaces? I don't know, something silly, and you comment on it. And that's the one thing that makes that person feel that they were noticed in the world and that they mattered, even for a second. That might be the thing that sparks them to keep going on. I don't know. That's the thing, we don't know. We don't know. But how easy would it be to sit there, scowl at your person, you know, and pretend you don't exist? I wonder what would be easier for us to do. Make a, a rude comment towards that person, or a genuinely heartfelt nice comment towards that person. That's kind of everybody in life, generally, who we interact with. It's harder to make those, those nice comments that build up people, because relationships, healthy environments, even just other people. And I know it's almost a, a meme where we will say these ridiculous things that build up other people, but that's the problem with it. It's a, it's a meme. And we just say things that aren't true to people. We intuitively know that, we're, that they're not true. Like, you came up to me like, oh, scout man, you know, man, nice hair. <laughs> I know you're full of shit. <laughs> that compliment may as well have not even been made to me because I just know it's not true. And that isn't like a thing where, like, I mean, that's an objective reality. It isn't like you can have a disagreement about that. You know? You, it's, it's something that, that, that's real and that a person is going to know. If you say that, I might be like, that's right, queen, yes. <laughs> You know, you tell me, King, that's right, we gotta lift each other up. But we know that we're not lifting each other up any, with anything real. You know, because to be able to, to say something nice about another person means that you have to study them to assess, to, to know, to recognize something about them. It doesn't mean you sit there in the trolley like, <laughs> staring at people, you know, trying to find something nice to say. But that means that you have to notice it, which means that the person has to be noticed. And that's the thing that builds people up, the fact that you notice them. I mean, we all want to be noticed, and yet we should notice each other as well. And this other side over here is so much easier to do. You know, it's easy to, it's easy to, to laugh, it's easy to hate, but it takes, it takes strength to be gentle and kind. And so this is simple, man. Take a sledgehammer to Michelangelo, fine, make Michelangelo. Take a sledgehammer to someone's dream, yeah. make your own, build it up, do that. And it isn't just a matter of saying, shut up. It's a matter of saying, really, <laughs> build your own, make it. Because by doing so, not only are you going to make the world a better place for you, but you're also going to make the world a better place for everybody else. This makes the world a worse place for you. This makes the world a worse place for everybody else. This is the thing that makes the world a better place. But it has to be underlined by this thing of truth. It has to be real. You don't make the world a better place by making up false compliments. You don't make the world a better place by pretending it's a healthy environment or a healthy relationship. You make it a better place by making it those things. And that's the problem. And I shouldn't say the problem. That's the cool thing, I guess. Because for those, I don't know, again, don't, don't answer these things, but I wonder how many of you are in healthy environments at home. And if so, think about how much time that takes to make it. It's a full-time job, dude. I don't know how many of you are in healthy environment, in healthy relationships. That's a full-time job, man. I mean, if you do these things here, you don't have time for anything else. You know, when you finally get about the business of living, there's no time for anything else. You don't have time to destroy. You're too busy building. Because this is the problem with Leonardo. He had time to tear away at, at Michelangelo. Michelangelo didn't have time for it. He had some place he had to be. He had something he had to create. You know? So... If you find yourself doing this, it's a probably a pretty good indication that you're not doing enough of this. And that's why you're so miserable. And I mean that with all the love in the world, man. Please know where I'm coming from when I say that. But that's probably what makes you so miserable that you have to take time out of your day to do this stuff.
Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques? I like this quote.